This morning we're diving into Luke chapter 15. We're in this series called The Table. And it's, it's a look kind of at the things we can learn or, or the stories where uh, a meal is central. And uh, Marcus Bart in Rediscovering the Lord's Supper says this, just simply that in approximately one-fifth of the sentences in Luke's gospel and in Acts, meals play a conspicuous role. So somehow a lot of what we get is the whole story in the New Testament or of the gospels takes place around this kind of subplot or the sub-theme of when, when there's a meal taking place or in a house at a meal, a little bit more of a private or intimate conversation and really getting at deeper issues. And so it's an interesting thing to kind of go through Luke with the meal as some kind of a lens that we're putting on. And so in uh, Luke 15, we're going to cover a lot of scripture. I'm going to try and read it hopefully fast enough, quick enough that you can hang with me, but, but just covering um, some parables that Jesus, Jesus gives. And he gives them because we're told this, that the tax collectors, who were people that were, ex- so, so usually Jewish people who were um, for the Romans or for the, the, the government, um, which was not seen as, as friendly to the Jewish people, um, taking the taxes of people and giving a lot of license to in some ways extort them or to lean on them or to line their own pockets. But basically they were, they were doing the dirty work for empire. And so these are people that, that are beginning to be more and more ostracized from their community and have probably seared their conscience, uh, conscience and just been like, uh, whatever, who cares? Um, at least I'm getting mine or, or I'm going to live a different way, but they're, but they're really at odds with their community. And so the tax collectors and the sinners, the ones that, that aren't private sinners, you know, there's a difference between public sinners and private sinners. All of us in this room are private sinners, right? Um, we all hide our stuff and, and we learn to hide it well, but some people, uh, their sin kind of becomes public. It becomes a part of their identity. It becomes a part of how people see them or know them. It's their reputation. And so from a distance, you know who they are as they come and, and they begin to hang around Jesus. So it's a really interesting thing. So these, these people that are dissonant to your broader majority community are hanging around Jesus. They're all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees, the pastors, and the teachers of the law they muttered, this man welcomes sinners, and he eats with them. He eats with them. So you begin to see the table emerge in this whole kind of narrative that we're going to jump into. Real quickly, um, all of us will talk to sinners. We'll talk to public sinners. We'll talk to the people at odds. We'll kind of we'll engage them during the day when we're kind of um, in our business hours, right? We'll have a meeting with them, or we'll kind of chalk that up as part of what we're supposed to do. But when we go to sit at the table, when we go to have a meal, we want our people around us there. We, we, that's kind of the more intimate time. That's kind of the, we're going to do real business time. And, and what these Pharisees are kind of tripping on is that Jesus, by bringing them all the way to the table, is in some sense saying that he has fellowship with them. That, that they're even closer than just kind of a, at a public space or, or that he's talking to them or willing to engage them or kind of look down on them and, and, and tolerate them. But he's actually bringing them to the table and eating with them as if there's nothing wrong, as if they're peers, as if there's a relationship, as if they have fellowship. And these Pharisees can't understand that. Um, is he making light of sin? Is he, is he making light, that they're sinners, is he making light of it, brushing that aside? Is he forgetting that, that God is a holy God? Is he, like, what's going on that Jesus would do this? And so Jesus launches into a set of three parables, and they build on each other. The first two, very similar, and then the third kind of expands it. It's much longer, and it tries to draw in a lot of nuance. So watch it as we kind of go along, how Jesus sets kind of this, the, the heart of the story, And then he wants to pull back and show you the bigger picture of the story. So the first one is simply this. It's the parable of the lost sheep. And Jesus says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep. 
and then loses one of them? Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and he says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. And I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So Jesus paints this picture. you got this open field. There's 100 sheep. One of them goes away. And the shepherd is going to leave the 99 in the open field. Why is open field symbolic? It's symbolic because they're safe. This is not like on the precipice. It's not through the valley of the shadow of death where there's, there's animals that are going to get them or kind of pick them off. This is the open country where there's peace, where they're safe, where they can graze. And he's going to leave them there where they're okay. And he's going to go off and find the one that's not okay, that could be in danger, that's lost, probably doesn't know how to get back, and is vulnerable. And the shepherd's going to go off, and the, the shepherd might be gone for a long time. He has to be away from his family, so to speak, or his property, or what he loves, his livelihood. He finds the one sheep, returns it back, so everything is as it ought to be, and he's excited. I just put a lot of time and energy and passion in, into this and, and wondering of what's going on and wandering around. And then I found that sheep. Now I'm back. It's full. It's right. It's good. Let's eat. Let's see, come join me, let's eat, let's celebrate. I can take a deep breath right now. And then Jesus goes this much further and he says, I tell you the truth, um, when one sinner repents, there's more rejoicing in heaven than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. That's an offensive verse unless we really understand what's going on here. Um, what Jesus is saying without trying to be offensive is it's great that you guys are here at church on on a Sunday morning. This might be like the 432nd Sunday in a row that you've come to church, not missed a week. You might have been coming to church your whole life. You might bring your family to church. It's great that you're here. I don't really care about that as much as I do when the person that just dried up that just sorted something out, that just acknowledged that they'd made a mess of their community or their family or their children or whatever it might be, the person that's coming in completely broken and realizing they can't do it on their own and they walk in for their very first Sunday or if it's not even a Sunday morning, if it's that person for the very first time comes to a small group or comes to your house where there are other Christians and they're saying, I'm ready to listen, I'm ready to hear, I can't do this on my own, I'm lost. And what Jesus is saying is that right there causes more rejoicing, more reason to celebrate than all the other sheep, all the other Christians, all the other moral people, all the, all the other righteous people that really weren't in danger of anything. And it's wonderful that they're there and they're where they're supposed to be. But, but that's not as, as energizing as returning somebody or adding somebody to that number so that things are now full or more full. And it's a, it's a little bit of a, st- a strange thing because if you're already found, you're like, well, where am I in that story? Where am I in that story? Should I go get lost <laughs> so that I can be refound? And then, and then maybe I can... Uh, like I can be the center of attention or, or people can celebrate me. I mean, it begins to make you wonder that way, doesn't it? I want God to rejoice over me. I want, I want the angels in heaven to rejoice over me. I'd like to be special. So you kind of have this little tension there that this person is more important than all these people. We want to say to Jesus, aren't they all important? Aren't they equally important? And what we're doing is we're really missing the the energy in the story. So Jesus gives this next little short parable and he says, I suppose, uh, or suppose a woman who has 10 silver coins loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. 
And in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What, what Jesus is doing in this little parable is giving you this picture of somebody lighting a lamp in the dark or shining a flashlight. Maybe, maybe that contact lens will, will put off some light or the, the diamond in that ring, the wedding ring that was lost. Like maybe we can get a twinkle and find it. And so you get this picture of somebody really searching. Uh, my mom, when I grew up, was really good at knowing where everything, everything was. I'm really good at efficiency. So I learned really quickly that it's a lot easier to just ask my mom where something is than to actually look. Okay? My wife is really good on not spoiling me. And so when, when I try to do that same thing, like where is something, she, she would like me to actually look and, and, and try to find it. But this whole subplot's going on when I can't find something, start hollering if someone knows where it is, and, and then I have to start looking and my anxiety starts going up. We've got a dog that comes and will grab just one sock and cart it around the house. So I can never find, I can never match things up. And, uh, or, you, I mean, you know what it's like. You can't find one shoe um, you can't find because it's underneath piles of who knows what. And, and I start getting all this anxiety, like, like the world depends on that shoe being found. Why don't you just wear another pair of shoes? No. You're going to be late. I don't care. Um, I'm also good at stubborn. Um, that's my dad's side of the family because um, we're Dutch. Uh, I love how you can use... Uh, cultural, ethnic things is an excuse for stuff. I love that. Um, so you, you get this kind of energy of looking for something. I still think we kind of miss it. I was driving yesterday uh, to Portland. Esther went with me, drove all the way to Portland for a friend's birthday, surprise birthday party for his 50th, and then drove back last night, got home at midnight. But when we were driving past Hood on the way there yesterday, the sun was setting, there were these search and rescue kind of um, vans out or, or, or a SUVs, kind of at the base of Mount Hood. And I, I thought about that. I'm like, search and rescue. Now, that's a good picture. Like, search and rescue on Mount Hood is somebody's life is, is on the line, and, and there's a ticking clock. There's a window here of when, when they can be found and still be okay. And so there's this urgency to it. You know, either they got hurt or, no, or lost or nobody's heard from them or there's a storm that came in and, and if they stay up there for too long or, or for too many nights, um, they're going to die. And people die on Mount Hood on a regular basis. And so search and rescue, when they get this call, all of a sudden there's somebody lost and they need to be found and they go at it. And when they are found, the news rejoices Portland, Oregon, uh, the Northwest, it's all over. We all rejoice. Those families rejoice because what could have been lost, permanently lost, has been found. And it's safe. And they go home and they sit down and they probably want to gather around a table and just soak it in and just freeze that moment and say, we're so glad that we can have another meal, that we can be together again. We can be around the fireplace uh, or that we can share a holiday or something like that because what was lost was found. And so Jesus is trying to create that urgency. Um, and he's saying, in the same way, there is much rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. It's an interesting thing when we talk about coins in the Bible, it, it just doesn't energize us. Why is that? Why is that? No, because it's coins. It, yes, it's money, but it's coins. I throw those in, uh, away in the trash. It's like, I don't want them in my pocket. They got germs, they got germs on them. I, used to, I, I did that once. I didn't do that ever. I'm not telling you guys that. The, but now that I have kids, it's, it's a lot easier. It's like, I don't want these coins. They're dirty. They have germs on them. Kids. <laughs> Who wants coins, right? But we, we think of coins as not something that we're really going to try hard to find. But in Jesus' day, what we're talking about is like that $1,000 bill. 
um, that securities bond, the title to your house, um, your passport. You know, it, it's like this has to be found. It's not a common thing. And so there's this energy. So Jesus has now created this idea that um, when things are lost, we naturally want to find those, don't we? And when we find those, we're excited, we want to celebrate, we want to go get somewhere and just kind of go, ah, things are as they ought to be. Do you see how that's what Jesus is creating here in those two stories? Now he wants to contextualize it for us in, deeply and fully in terms of relationship and people. So we've had sheep, we've had a coin. What does it look like with people? And we get this parable of the lost son. So we've had lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. This is just one continuous story. And so let's read that, the parable of the prodigal. And Jesus says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the state. I'm not going to wait till you die to get my inheritance. Give it to me now. And so he divided, the father did, his property between them. And not, not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, and he set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out into the fields uh, to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. And so he got up and he went to his father. And so we see something here that I think is, it has to be recognized in this story, is that all throughout scripture, there's, there's the idea that when you live apart from God, it is worse for you than if you live with God or, or following God in faith, um, living by faith with all that God has said or commanded. That, that in some sense, distance from God allows you to maybe be more free, more licentious, do whatever you want, wild. But in the end, it leads to greater want, greater emptiness, a, a hole in your stomach. It doesn't satisfy. And that you begin to go, what would it be like to actually be the person I want to be? To actually go to bed at night and feel good about myself. To feel like I'm not hiding from God or estranged from God, but that I'm with God. That that's kind of this thing that all throughout Scripture we see that there's this either or and you can walk away, but it's somehow less than. And so this story, Jesus is saying, this guy realizes that it's so bad for me that even the people that don't really belong to my father, he still honors them well. He takes good care of them and they have excess. So even the people a couple layers out in my father's estate have excess. Here on my own, I don't even have what the pigs have. And you know what? Maybe I made a mistake. So he actually lets the want, the depression, the lack of satisfaction lead to a bigger conversation of, um, I made a mistake and I broke from my father. I need to be reconciled to my father. We, we talk about this all the time in society as hitting rock bottom. Some of you here um, might be there, right? Um, boy, I've sure made a mess of things. Boy, this, this stuff that I'm doing, this course that I'm on, it really doesn't satisfy. And I made decisions along the way. I know that I did. Against people, over the top of people, decisions that might have hurt other people. Like I've done that and now I'm, I'm in this position and I recognize not a good place to be. There's so many other places where I could have landed that would have been better. And that rock bottom now makes you think, I need to go back and I need to address some of this. You know what? You were right. You know what? I'm sorry. You know what? I've made a mess of things. Can, can we try to patch some of this stuff back up? And so that's what this son is doing at this point. He's just going back and saying, maybe I can just scoot in at the third, the third level and, and work for my father, and at least then I'd have food. But as part of that, I need to say that I've sinned against him. I need to be reconciled. And so as he comes back, um, 
he gets up and he goes uh, to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now, if you've studied the, the, this parable at all, you know or you've read or you've heard that this is a very key verse in the whole story. That you've got long robes in that culture, in that day and age, and to run, you have to hike up your robes, um, and you would run. This is not something that in a culture that deals with respect, it's an honor culture, that the patriarch who has multiple generations living on his estate would, would hike up and run down the road to, for any kind of a reason. It's, it's not the cultural way of doing it. And what you see is, like the shepherd that went after the sheep, like the woman searching for the coin, now you have a father that sees a lost son and says, I'm going to go find that son. I'm going to go reclaim that son. That son is on his way back. I can now go grab him, and I can bring him into where he's supposed to be. He can be redeemed. He can be found again. And the father runs to that son. And the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine that was dead is alive again. And he was lost and now is, uh, and now is found. And so they began to celebrate. We're now at the point of the parable where Jesus was at with the tax collectors and the sinners coming and sharing meals with him. So Jesus is now showing how he views these people. These people, you Pharisees and teachers of the law, that are, you see them and you're judging them and you just can't get your mind wrapped around how these people are coming in around me. You don't understand. This is how I see them. I see them as having been dead, but now they're alive again. I have been lost and now they're found and, and I'm rejoicing. Can you not see how I'm rejoicing at the spiritual goodness, like the earth shattering goodness of what's happening here? How are you missing that? And so then Jesus does something interesting in this parable. He takes it a step further and he brings in a plot twist. So up until now, we've had the subject and the object. Shepherd, sheep, woman, coin, father, son, subject, object. Now all of a sudden Jesus steps back and brings somebody into the story that's a third party observer, uh, a neutral observer to what's going on. And then he wants to put us, the listener, the listener back then to this parable, and us as we listen it today, he wants to put us in that spot and maybe call out some of the hidden things in our heart. And so this is what he said. But when the father said, uh, but the father said to his servants, quick, go put the best robe on, the best ring, and kill the fattened calf. We're going to have a feast and celebrate. The son, the older son, you get this wonderful meanwhile. Meanwhile, the older son was in the, in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard the music and the dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. And the answer was, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Things are as they ought to be. We celebrate with the hope that things will be as they ought to be or we celebrate or rejoice because they have come to be as they ought to be. Um, it's, it's this wonderful, resonant, deep thing. At the end of the Hollywood movies, like with the Hollywood story, there's always rejoicing at the end. Why? Because whatever the tension was that was introduced, whatever that kind of crisis point was, resolves. And so at the end, everybody's smiling and they're, they're in the Boston pub and they're, they're, you know, toasting each other and it's all happy and there's great music and then it kind of leaves off and you're like, oh, I, I wish I could be there because that just looks like it's so as it ought to be. It's so warm. It's so perfect. It's, it's resolved. That's the feast. 
And so the son is coming in to this feast situation, and right away you see the dissonance that he has. He's not willing, from a heart standpoint, to enter into this and to celebrate, to toast, to be a part of the rejoicing because things are as they ought to be. He immediately reacts, and this is what he says. Um, he becomes angry, refuses to go in, so, so he throws a temper tantrum. Right? He's not even going to go in and sulk. He's going to stay outside and sulk. So he refuses to go in and his father comes out and he pleads with him. And he answers, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. You, fill, uh, you kill the fattened calf for him. If we can't resonate with this sense of not fair, this sense of wanting to get our just desserts, and if we haven't been as bad as that person, then somehow we should end up higher than that person. If we can't resonate with, with the tension in this story, then we're not really understanding it correctly. Um, and, and we were never given ice cream as kids because that's when we first learn it, right? Her scoops are bigger than my scoops. How come she got to pick two flavors in the same bowl? I should at least have equal amount or I'm bigger than a sibling. I get this one. So I should have proportionately more. Like we, we, I mean, this is so guttural for us, isn't it? And the father says, my son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. I don't understand the lack that you speak of. I don't understand how you're saying you're being slighted somehow by, by this person being rejoiced over because they're now returning to be a part of the household, to be in fellowship once again. Weren't you always at my table? Everything I ate, didn't you eat too? Weren't you always with me day and night where you could have asked for anything? Didn't you get the, the, the joy of having health and, and stability and safety? Weren't you always with me, together with me? Isn't that the highest? But this person who has experienced not joy in sin, but has squandered and, and lost and been depressed and sleepless and and hit bottom, they haven't been with me. They haven't known the warmth of my fire, kind of that, that resonant feeling of my table. They haven't even known my love or experienced my love. When that person was hungry, they didn't have me to ask for, for something. They, they couldn't benefit from me. That is now returned. And we should rejoice. Because things are as they ought to be. And it's an interesting thing. Tim Keller says this. He says this, uh, Neither son loved the father for himself. They both were using the father for their own self-centered ends rather than loving, enjoying, and serving him for his own sake. This means that you can rebel against God and be alienated from him either by breaking his rules or by keeping all of them diligently. It's a shocking message. Careful obedience to God's law may serve as a strategy for rebelling against God. That this older son who said, I have always done what was right and never disobeyed your orders, was doing it like a mercenary. I'm doing this not for the love of the thing itself and the joy of the thing itself, but as a strategy or a mechanism to profit myself 
and to gain advantage in life. And now when I see somebody come and gain uh, an advantage that I don't think I have, and they weren't doing the mechanism like I was doing or weren't doing it as well as I was doing, I'm going to cry foul and say, not fair. I was playing the game right, so I should have gotten this reward. They were playing the game wrong. How come they've got a bigger reward? And, and the father says to the son, and I think God says to us that it's not a game. It's not about your reward. And if you'd uh, understood it correctly, you would have been living up into the glory of God for all things are from, through, and to him. And in that, you would have had your greatest joy and lacked nothing. Jesus said, remain in my love as I remain in the Father's love. You do, you do this by obeying my commands. And I say this to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. So, so be with me. And obedience is certainly a part of that or repentance like this prodigal. And when you do that, you find fullness of joy, not apart from me, not because I dispense it to you as some kind of a reward that you've earned, but because you're with me. As Aquinas said, God alone constitutes our chief happiness. And so the faithful, as well as the rebellious, are missing the heart of God. The Pharisee, as well as the sinner, are in need of coming back into and being reconciled to a right understanding of what it means to be in relationship with God. Jesus is... is I mean, he understands this so intuitively and so clearly, and I mean, he's experiencing it. And he's saying, can you not see what is going, can you not see this? Can you not see it? I want to show you a cool painting that Rembrandt did. Rembrandt um, did this painting of the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son. You have onlookers, you have the son, and then you have the older son looking at it. And uh, this painting hangs in a museum in St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg named after Tsar Peter the Great. And there's a guy uh, that many, many might know, Henry Nouwen, uh, who wrote a lot of amazing literature in the, in the 80s. And I think he passed away in the 90s. Uh, and he wrote a book on this. Uh, not only the parable, but this painting. He went to St. Petersburg and he sat there and just studied it and studied it and studied it. Uh, and it's this kind of amazing story. And he really begins to hone in on that older brother. And we've got a picture of that. But you just see him evaluating this story. And if his heart is in the wrong place, if he doesn't understand, then there's no resonance like there are with the faces in the back where they're almost in a sublime way being drawn into the emotion of this. As the older brother, it's almost like the judge standing there in the harsh light, looking down and kind of condemning on this. Um, and Henry Nouwen, he says this, resentment and gratitude cannot coexist since resentment blocks the perception and experience of life as a gift. My resentment tells me that I don't receive what I deserve, and it always manifests itself in envy. This story is not just set in Jesus' time. I think it's as relevant today as it's ever been. Um, looking in my own heart, in this culture, in this day and age of abundance, there's so much abundance. In every new year, there's more abundance, more toys, more bells, more whistles, new upgrades to things I already have. You know what I'm talking about. Um, we know everybody else's life. Everything's so public. We see everybody else's life. And it's, it's really interesting how subtle it is that envy creeps up into our hearts. I work this hard. How come that person makes more money than me? Um... I'm a good person. How come that person seems to have an easier time in life? I serve people. How come that person's more popular? They're just self-serving, arrogant, and we envy and we have bitter, uh, bitterness and resentment. Um, I'm a good Christian. 
I do everything right. How come everything seems to be going wrong in my life? Um, my family's a mess. My finances might be a mess. My health. Just, how come I keep getting all of these kind of bad news messages? Is God not going to take care of me? And then this person, this person, for like 20 years, they've just screwed around. And now they become a Christian. Now they become a Christian. How come, how come I have to suffer through Christianity <laughs> um, with a dour face? And now they get to become Christians. And everybody uh, just seems to love them. They're like the most popular Christian now. I've earned it. I've, I've put in my time. I've, I've kind of walked that road. How come I'm not at the head of the line? How come I don't have more influence than they do? How come they're not being punished? Doing penance for all of those years and all of those sins. It's not really fair that they get off the hook so easy. They should have to pay for it. They shouldn't be on my level. And you know what? I'm not really happy even though I'm a Christian, I, I kind of find myself wondering what it would have been like to live their life. All that sin, I bet I, bet I would have enjoyed some of it. Maybe I could have just gone and done all that sin and then, and then I could just repent. I, I mean, maybe I wish, I wish I had known that when I was 20 had that thought that I could have just done 20 years of sinning and then repented and been really influential and well off because maybe I would have had some pleasure that way well it's too late now but man I, I feel kind of bitter inside and there's a proverb I think it's Proverbs 29 somewhere in chapter 20 or 29 but it's it's this don't envy the wicked and don't keep their company. There's a lie we're believing if we think that that kind of living is really going to satisfy us. We're only going to know alienation. And, and we're going to be chasing cotton candy and sin that will never fully sit well with us. Will only give us a stomach ache. And that true, deep, resonant living comes in being found with God. So the first part is we've missed it ourselves. We're like the older son in the parable. We don't really understand what it means to be a part of this household, to live on these grounds, to enjoy the fellowship of the Father, to, to have all of these things open to us and to be able to find joy in that. We've missed that. And in missing that, we're set up for this weird kind of envy and resentment that makes us want to judge others. You know what? Jeez, these small homes, man, first century Palestine, like these are small homes means out of all these hundreds of people that are following Jesus, not everybody gets to eat with him. So those tax collectors and sinners, man, they shouldn't be getting the seats. How did they get the seats at the table? How come they're being elevated to my level or where I should be, where, where I qualify to be? How come I don't get more of the pastor's time? Or how come the church doesn't jump at my ideas or my thoughts or my ministry outlet as much as someone else's? Like, I, they haven't earned it, that kind of seat, that kind of honor. And Jesus is flipping that whole thing on its, on its head and saying, but don't you understand? The fact that they're sitting at this table is cause for rejoicing. I came to seek and save the lost in this is the supreme example of it. I want to give you one more meal by way of example, and it comes in Luke 19. 
Luke 19, we see Zacchaeus, the tax collector. So it's funny, Jesus is telling the story at his audience, trying to pull them into the story. Live, live in my world as the Messiah, coming to seek and save the lost, and understand what I'm trying to do and what really gets me excited. I want you in my story, not just coldly observing it from the outside, not judging it. I want you in this story. And he's trying to do that, and it's funny because they miss it. A lot of them miss it. And so we see Jesus actually living this out with Zacchaeus. Jesus enters Jericho uh, and was passing through. So again, coming from up north, he would have come down by the Jordan River, missing Samaria, which, which they would have done to go around, come down that valley by the Jordan River, and then cut in at Jericho and start to head up to Jerusalem, what's called the Jericho Road, okay? Okay. And so he would have been coming through town, and right as they would have been entering town, what, what was the old kind of town, which excavations are still there, Jericho is believed to be the longest continuously inhabited city in the world, going back 10,000 years. A lot of farming um, things were actually learned and began to be practiced around Jericho because of the warm climate being so low um, right by the Dead Sea being so low that a lot of kind of building a walled city and being in one place and not continually uh, following after animals but actually cultivating land believe, is believed to have really kind of emerged in that area. And so as the road comes in to where the old town was, there are crowds that begin to gather and there's this guy um, named Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector. So we're going right back to Jesus' parables, right? The tax collectors and the sinners. And he was a chief tax collector, which means he'd been doing it for a while. And he was over other tax collectors. So this guy is at odds with the community. He has a built-in, baked reputation. It's been there for a while. It's, it's grooved. It's cut. It's notched. He's a chief tax collector. And he's very wealthy because of it. And he wanted to see who Jesus was. And being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Um, I've got a picture. This is, this is the traditional Zacchaeus um, sycamore tree. Um, whether it was or not, it's, if you go to Jericho, that's the tree that, uh, that everybody, all the tourist buses come to, and everybody piles out, and that's what is traditionally viewed as, as the sycamore tree that Zacchaeus climbed up in. So you can picture him getting up in a branch, and he's going to look for Jesus. And when Jesus reached that spot, he looked up, and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And so he, Zacchaeus, came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and they began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Why didn't he come to my house? My wife would have loved to have prepared a meal for us. All my friends would have seen him coming to my house. That would have been really cool. I think I, I deserve it at least as much as that guy, more than that guy. That's not really fair. He's going to eat with Zacchaeus. But Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated or defrauded anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Basically, I'm gonna take all my excess that was, that was gained by going above and beyond and, and extorting people. I'm gonna take all of it and give it back. Which is scary, by the way, to think of in one fell swoop making a promise or a commitment to just undo that much of your life. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. I could have gone to your house your wife probably would have cooked a great meal. Your friends would have thought you were really cool. But what really would have been the point of that? Hold that in comparison with the opportunity I had to go to Zacchaeus' house. 
Nobody expected it. It might have been bad food. Who knows? But with Zacchaeus, I had the opportunity of saving something, of bringing something dead back to life, of finding something that was lost. Do you not see that I would take this over 99 of these other meals, over 99 of the other people that deserve it more? Because here something really remarkable happens. And, and shouldn't you be excited that that's taken place? Because Jesus said, I came, I came to seek and to save the lost. This is why I'm here, to redeem things. Um, I don't know about you, but um, this kind of messes me up, this whole story and parable. Um, it's too easy to get comfortable in the Christian life. It's too easy to make it about me. It's too easy to begin looking for um, the faucet to be turned on and all the good things to flow. I want you to do something for me right now. I want you to lean back in your seat. Just, just lean back in your seat. It's comfortable, isn't it? That's, that's the normal kind of relaxed posture. It's too easy for that to be our Christianity. Now I want you to lean forward and put your, your elbows on your knees. Do you see the difference? Do you feel the difference? When you're leaning forward, you're engaged, you're anticipating, you're looking for something, you're, you're hanging on stuff, you're waiting for something, you're active, and it's, it's kind of a whole different dynamic. And what Jesus was really saying to these Pharisees was, shouldn't you be leaning forward? Shouldn't your elbows be on your knees? Shouldn't you see exactly when I... When, when I saw Zacchaeus, you saw him too. And shouldn't you have thought, now that would be a story. That guy, really? Chief tax collector? Now that would be a salvation story. And shouldn't you have thought, man, that person who's been sinning all these years, like they are so far gone. Their family's been praying for them. Their friends have been talking to them. They don't listen to anybody they are so far gone. Now that would, make, that would make a really good story. You know, if I could play a part in that, I'll play a part. Jesus, let's do this together. You call the play. Do I got a block? Am I the tight end? Am I the receiver? What am I doing here? I'll even run off the field. I'll take myself out of the game if you need to bring somebody else into the game. I, I, I'll take my number, my jersey, me out of the game if it means that we can run a play for, for, for this one here because we can find something that was lost. And when we do, let's celebrate that. Let's baptize that person. Let's all gather around the river. Let's, let's bring that person over to our house and start talking about the joy that we share now in salvation. And I'm gonna even look at that person and go, man, that person, that person, that really knows the joy because they were really sinning and really empty and now they're found and they're like, man, grace is amazing. That person, you know, I'm actually gonna learn a little something from the twinkle in their eye. I remember that day when I was 22 when the birds chirped. I, I began to hear them a little bit more. And the sunsets, they seemed to linger a little longer. When I got saved, it was like creation came alive. And you know what? I'm seeing that again in this person's eyes. Like that's, that's what it looks like when you find your first love. That's what I want again. Like let's talk. Let's, let's, why don't you come be a part of my small group? Why don't, why don't you come be a part of what I, let's dream about how we can serve this community. And you know what? I don't even have many non-Christian friends anymore because I've been in church too long. You got like, too many of them. Let's, let's start talking about this. How do, we, how do we bring your friends to my table? How can I kill the fattened calf? 
How can I serve them and show them I want relationship with you? We're peers. I care about you. I would love to see you find joy. Find what you were created for. Find this relationship. And Jesus is saying, how come you're not leaning into this? How come you're sitting back in the harsh light looking down and thinking with everything you see, do I like what this says about me? Do I think it's fair with regard to me? How does it compare with what I'm getting? Am I getting enough? Is somebody getting something that I deserve or they're getting something they don't deserve? And Jesus is saying, boy, that's a dangerous game. It's a dangerous game. And when you find yourself in that spot, you're missing the story of the New Testament. You're missing the story of Jesus. You're missing that he was the good shepherd that is seeking to find, to save, to redeem, to bring back to life, to make the blind see. And anywhere we find ourselves outside of that story, anywhere, even as Christians, even as those that are obedient or moralistic, anywhere outside of that story, we're outside of that story. And Zacchaeus puts us to shame. You know what's funny about Zacchaeus? He didn't say a sinner's prayer. Jesus didn't say, now, before we move on, that's really cool about the poor and, and all that stuff, <clears throat> but let's say this prayer, repeat after me. Jesus didn't do that. Doesn't make it wrong, doesn't make it bad. But Jesus is saying that heart is a converted heart. And today, salvation has come to this house. This person has entered into my story and become a part of that story. I want to read from um, this book that I like, I'm fond of. It's a collection of Puritan prayers. And this will just kind of be uh, the closing prayer and then um, we're going to do special music in the offering. But let me just read this by way of a prayer. Uh, you can close your eyes if you want. Um, but please lean forward and don't lean back and try and wrestle with the idea of what kind of Christians. I mean, what do we really want for this church? Do we want Antioch to be comfortable? Or do we want to be celebrating every week going, man, I saw a sinner there, <laughs> a good one, like a big one, big sinner. It's a little awkward. I got over it, though, like, but boy, this is going to be interesting, right? Like, do, do we want this to be comfortable? Is that how we're going to define this? Or do we want this to be, to be a place where Jesus is using us as his body to seek and save the lost in this place at this time where he has us? I want it to be that. I think we are that, by the way. Um, I rejoice in a lot of the emails we get to see as staff or that, that, that get passed along. I rejoice. Um, I love this church. I was with somebody last night that was commiser uh, commiserating about their church. And I don't know if this is sin or not. Um, but as they were commiserating, I was gloating. And I was like taking a lot of pride in who you are and who we are. And, I, and it was, I think it was a very worldly, fleshly kind of gloat. Um, but it was cool. It was, <laughs> Do you know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> oh, Lord of grace. The world is before me this day, and I'm weak and I'm fearful. But I look to thee for strength. If I venture forth alone, I stumble and I fall. But on the beloved's arms... I am firm as the eternal hills. And if left to the treachery of my own heart, I shall shame thy name. But if enlightened, guided, upheld by thy spirit, I shall bring thee glory. Be thou my arm to support, my strength to stand, my light to see, my feet to run, my shield to protect, my sword to repel, my sun to warm. To enrich me will not diminish thy fullness. All thy loving kindness is in thy son. I accept his worthiness for my unworthiness, his sinlessness for my transgressions, 
his purity for my uncleanness, his sincerity for my guile, his truth for my deceits, his meekness for my pride, his constancy for my backslidings, his love for my enmity, his fullness for my emptiness, his faithfulness for my treachery, his obedience for my lawlessness, his glory for my shame, his devotedness for my waywardness, his holy life for my unchaste ways, his righteousness for my dead works, his death for my life. I'll find my joy in him. Amen.